Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brother Jim, for that. Brother Dale, I like that new band you got. Take them around wherever you want them. All right. I like the old one better, though. It always takes me a minute after Brother Jen sings like that to compose myself. The song is incredible. Brother Jen, when he sings, it reminds me of one of my best friends who just died about a year and a half ago. And I just, I just hear, I hear my boy Sando every time Brother Jen sings. It just gets in my heart. So thank you all for participating this morning. We're looking forward now to getting back after a couple weeks into our, our walk through Ephesians. And we are in Ephesians chapter 5 today. We are in a section that really is about the walk. And we're over the next, we started a week, uh, the last couple of times, and over the next uh, few times through the end of the chapter, really, we'll be, we'll be looking at it, the, the, the Christian walk, as this part of Ephesians is really about the application of the doctrine that we covered in the first half of the book of Ephesians. Now we're getting into application. And what does it really look like for us as Christians? Today, we are studying the imitating walk. The imitating walk, if you will. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The scripture says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving offense. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let's pray. Father, uh, again, as we are, every time we, we read your word, we're thankful for it. God, thank you for uh, allowing us to have some understanding of who you are through your word. Pray that as we uh, study this morning, that uh, we'll understand well, we'll understand right the application of your word to our lives, God, knowing that your your word is not just a, a history, but it is a, it is living, it is breathing, it, it, it is alive, and it applies in our lives today. So, Father, we, we want to apply it well, we want to understand it well, we want to worship you well as a result of hearing it, as, as a result of understanding and applying it in our lives. We pray, God, that you are glorified uh, by, by the way that we walk. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, this morning as we start studying about this, this imitating walk, the, the first thing that, that I want to talk about is the fact that we all imitate someone. We're all imitating someone in our walk. We want to make sure that it's God. We're all imitating someone. Um, it's very easy for us to, to see as we think about our lives, that we're imitating someone. Whether it be, sometimes you're imitating someone for a laugh. Right? You, 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 you. I bet, you know, eventually there will be imitations of Pastor Lewis around here, right? And, um, with their JV football team. I was talking to the JV football team, my coach, last week, trying to give them a, a pep talk for our last two weeks. We've, we've kind of we're 0-5-1. Okay, we've had a kind of a rough season. Um, but we're trying to give them a pep talk and talk about some of the some of the joy uh, that we have from this season. And, and some of the some of the joy that I talked to them about came from the memories that they'll have. And they, they do a great imitation of one of the coaches, not this one, but another one of the coaches. And, and I brought that up and it's just all kinds of laughter from the boys. And so, you know, sometimes we imitate for a laugh. Sometimes we, we imitate people and we don't even know it. You know, you, it's just a part of who you are. Maybe some of you have heard someone come up to you, you know, you are just like your grandfather. Or you're just like your grandmother. Or you're just like Uncle Joe or whatever. 
and, and, and maybe you don't even know it. You know, it's been such a part of who you are that you don't even recognize that you're imitating that person. Maybe you've you've done it uh, most assuredly, knowing that you're imitating someone. I know as as children we are we are prone to to imitate our, our parents. I know as, as a young boy I, I was prone to imitate my dad. You know, wanted to be like him and, and do all kinds of things like him. And, 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 that, and that's a good, good thing on, on a certain level. One time, now keep in mind, my dad, I, my dad was 18 when I was born, so I had a lot of shaping and molding of him to do as I grew up, right? <laughs> so, you know, as, as a youngster, as a, you know, early school age child, my dad now is a He's a fine man of God. There was work to do when he was 18, 19, 20, that the Lord was at work on. And so maybe there was a time or two when in imitating my dad at school, I might have said some words that I shouldn't have been imitating. Right? And it, and it, and it got me in trouble. And so the, the point is that we all imitate someone, we better make sure of who we're imitating. That it's a good imitation. It's a good one to imitate is the idea that we want to get at today. And the scripture tells us that as Christians, we want to be imitating God. We want to be imitating God. Because if God gives us a, a holy, righteous, perfect standard. If we're imitating God, guess what? We'll, we'll, be, we'll be perfect if we imitate Him perfectly. If we imitate him perfectly, we will. He, he, he doesn't. He, he never slips up and says words that he shouldn't say. He never slips up and, and, and makes a choice that, that he shouldn't have made. He's made every right choice. He said every right word. And if we imitate him, we'll always be in a good place. It, it, it's, just, it's just a fact. We will. If we're imitating people, even godly people. People will fail. And if our only imitation is of that person, we will fail. Even Paul, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right? So, so it, it, it's important for us to, to be imitating role models to have Christian mentors. We, we talk a lot about that around here, don't we? Discipleship, mentorship, being involved in relationships with people that are discipleship relationships, having someone that's more mature than you pouring into you, and you're pouring into someone that's less spiritually mature than you. And so it's important for us to have that, that relationship of, 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 an, of a more mature Christian, but we are, we are only to imitate them as they are imitating Christ is they are imitating God. Because that's the, that's the model that has no, no failure in it. That's the model that will have no falling in it for us. And so even as our goal is to imitate God, and even as we are imitating God, we use people along the way to help us get there, we want to understand that we only imitate them in as much as they are imitating God. That requires us to be getting into the Word of God. Because the question is, well, how do I know if they're imitating God or not? I've got to check it. I've got to get into the Word. I've got, I've got to be able to, to understand whether or not this person looks like God, whether or not this person sounds like God, acts like God, is talking like God, or is it counterfeit? Is it something that I should not be imitating? And so I, I've, got to be, I've, I've got to be growing in the Word to be able to understand whether or not the person I'm imitating is really leading me to God or not. But... At the same time, I also understand that I have access to God's Word, which gives me the ability to, to go and imitate God Himself without an intermediary, to, to, to understand things of God and understand how I should be walking. And so we want to be imitators of God. We're all imitating somebody. Make sure it's God. As we continue working through the Scripture, we understand now that the imitating walk is a walk of love. The imitating walk is a walk of love. In verse 2, walk in love just as Christ also loved you 
He gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And so the, the first step, if you will, in imitating God is to walk in love. What exactly does that mean? We read, we read in the scriptures that God is love. God is love. And so one of the things we understand about that is that it's a, it's a defining characteristic of, of who he is. It, it, it's not just that God does love. It's that God is love. It, it, it defines him and he in fact defines love. And, and so when we're imitating God, guess what? That it needs to be a definition of, of who we are. When we're walking, when people look at us and, and think, if, if we are an imitation of God, if we are imitating God, people need to see, then, that we are love. Oh, I got that person right there that de really defines, that's the definition of love that I see in his life or, or her life, in that church's life. That, that's what we, that's the way we, we should be living, that's what we should be putting out to the world, that that just as God is love, that we are representing Him well, and we are love. The Scripture says then, um, as we think about this walking in love, the question in Scripture points us to the answer. Who do I love? Scripture says, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And so, as, as we think about that, as I think about who who is my neighbor? The natural offshoot of that question is who is my neighbor? And we understand the scripture tells us that anyone I come in contact with is my neighbor. People that I, I work with, people that I go to school with, someone that I, a stranger that I meet becomes my neighbor. And so I am to, I am to love anyone that I come in contact with. We as a church try to be intentional about that, not just waiting for the happenstance meetings of, of people. We, we want to we want to be expressing God's love intentionally, reaching out to people. It's one of the reasons that we, we feed the, the students at Cummings, the football team, and, and the band coming up this Friday. We will be doing that again. So come and, and be a part of that. It's an opportunity to to show God's love, to, to imitate God's love by loving our neighbors. Why do we do things like that? It's to, it's to show who God is. It's to point back to God. It's not to say that we love this, on, love this way on our own. It's to show that we love this way because we're imitating God. And we want you to know the God of the Bible that we know. Because he's the one true living God. We've also studied a lot though as we've been working through the book of Ephesians that when it comes to who I am to love, that we, we love our neighbor, but we also understand it is so important for Christians in proving that we are Christians, that we have love for one another, that we have love for one another. The great proof that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, the great proof that we are imitators of God, is our love for one another. And so, it, 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 boy, we, we have to love our neighbors. We have to, to serve well. But we also have to love one another well. It's important for us to remember that, be reminded of that week after week after week. And then the, he goes on to tell us how that is. How is it that we are supposed to love? Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering, and a sacrifice. So we are to love our neighbors and each other in a sacrificial way. We are to love each other sacrificially. And generally when we think about a sacrificial love, we kind of think of it in this kind of I'll, I'll give my life for you. That, that's what Jesus ultimately did, right? He, he gave his life for us. And so sometimes when we're thinking about loving each other sacrificially, we think of it in, well, you know, I'll give my life for, for my brother, my sister in Christ. And, and believe it or not, it can be easy for us to say, well, yeah, I'd I, I give my life for Alan Hughes. I'd give my life for 
Deborah Best, maybe not Ricky, but Deborah. Oh, for sure, right? We say these, we say, yeah, I, I, give, I give my life to my brother or sister. And you know why we say that? Because chances are, the chances are very good here in America that I'll never actually have to give my life for Alan Hughes. I'll never actually have to give my life for Deborah Best or Ricky Best. I'll never have to do it. So I can say, yes, I love my brother, I love my sister sacrificially because as I'm thinking about the way that, uh, that people generally apply it, I will never have to apply it. But guess what? It goes much further than that, this idea of sacrificial love. This idea of sacrificial love. And this is why the, we don't, we're, we're not that great at sacrificial love generally in churches. That's why you see churches split every day. Every week, churches split because churches say, I'll die for that person, but I won't give up blue carpet for that person. You hear what I'm saying? I'll die for them, but I won't give up my type of music for them. I'll die for them, but I won't give up King James only for them. You see, sacrificial love says, I'll die for them, and guess what? If it's the best for the, for the, for the movement of the gospel, I'll give up my carpet for them. I'll die for them, and if it's best for the promotion of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'll give up this type of music for them. If it's best for the gospel of Jesus Christ, I might even say that, I'm going to put my foot in the hornet's nest here. You know what? It might be best that we move this organ out one day. Because, you know, we got all these people crowded up here. And we don't use this. You know what? I'll sacrifice the great memories I have of that. It's served its purpose. It's done well. But now I see that, that, that we use something different to, to promote the gospel through music. And sacrificial love says, um, I'll sacrifice that. Not just for my brother or sister who's here, but even for the one who is not yet my sister or brother, who will hear. And, and, and these, these are just, these are some of the things that we think about when we think about sacrificial love and the depth to which it goes. Will I? Am I? truly loving in a sacrificial way. And sometimes I know you, you can think, well, well I, I just always end up on the sacrificing end. No one ever sacrifices anything for me. Consider your mom. Consider the one you're imitating. He sacrificed it all and continues to sacrifice. He sacrificed it all and we still sin. We still keep going out in our way. It's a big thing to think about sacrificial love, friends. But if you want to be an imitator of God, this is what we call to be. We call to imitate God. One of the things that, the, that we're to do when we're imitating God is to walk in love. And this love is a sacrificial love. And the sacrificial love has everyday application. It's not just a big idea of I'm willing to die for somebody. No, I'm, I'm willing to die to self for somebody. And that really applies each and every day. And guess what? If a person is sacrificing for you, if, if, if it comes to the reality in church of sacrificing a style of music or sacrificing over an organ or sacrificing over any other piece of tradition, then those who are being sacrificed for, you have to understand what the other person is going through. You have to understand that if there's a group of people that, that, are, that are giving up, so to speak, their love of, of, of singing hymns on every song, you have to understand that, that there's a sensitivity there and we have to sacrificially love them back and help them through that. The, the sacrificial love is not just a one-way street. It, it goes both ways. 
And friends, we will, we will become the church that God desires us to be when we truly grasp sacrificially loving each other. And when, and when we start to become the church God wants us to be, understand that that's pleasing to Him. And that's what matters most. Might I say that that's what matters only? Is pleasing Him. Pleasing Him. Sacrificial love, walking in love, is the way that we do it. And why is that? Because it's a fragrant aroma. It pleases Him. He likes it. The next thing we'll see about the imitating walk is that it is a, a saintly walk. Verse 3 says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And so we, we have some things that, that shouldn't be, that we shouldn't be walking in that are listed here. Immoralities, talking largely of sexual immorality here, uh, impurity, greed. These things must not be named among you. No one should have any reason to say that if you are a Christian imitating God, that sexual immorality or impurity or greed is, 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 has anything to do with, with who you are. Okay? Now, understand that it's not, I mean, we talk, we've talked about this a couple of times as well, when we talk about taking off, taking off the old and putting on the new. This, this kind of continues that thought process that even as we're talking about immorality, impurity, and greed not being named among us, that is, that's not enough. That's not the, the, the total equation here. That's just taking off the old, okay? We don't take off the old to walk in neutrality. We take off the old and we put on the new. So that we take off the old, the, the, the immorality, the impurity, the agree, and then we put on the new, walking as the saints. Walking as a saint. Walking as a holy one. As a holy one. And, and so it's not enough just to not be uh, in, listed among the sexual, immoral, or impure, or greedy. It's not enough for that, just not to be named there. The call, if we're imitating God, is to walk as a holy one. Walk as a holy one. Because see, I can take all that off and do nothing. But I'm going to take all that off and I'm to walk as a holy one. Which means I'm to, I'm to walk that way. And as we'll get to in a minute, I'm to talk that way. And people are to know that, that not only am I not walking that way, but hey, the scriptures say that we should be walking this way. And living this way as a holy one, imitating God, who is, as we've said, perfectly holy and righteous. Be a saint. The imitating walk is a thankful walk. Verse 4 There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And so, kind of along the same idea, along the same lines that we're talking about, the, the the, the silly, jesting, filthy talk. Hey, so this doesn't mean that we can't have a sense of humor. This doesn't mean that we can't laugh and, and have fun. But uh, the, the double entendre shouldn't be part of, of who we are. The, the, the dirty sarcasm, the, the, filth, the, the dirty jokes. You know, many of you have the old uncle who has all the dirty jokes, right? But that shouldn't be part of who we are. Shouldn't be part of who we are. When we are imitating God. And again, it's not just enough to not be the one who delivers the dirty joke. Not be the one who dips into the double entendre. Not the one who uh, you know, doesn't do this or doesn't do that. But we are to be filled with giving thanks. So instead, our, 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 our voices, instead of doing filthy stuff, coarse jesting, should be filled with giving thanks to God. So with, with every opportunity we have, we should be praising God and giving God the glory and honor for what we see. Looking for every opportunity to turn conversations to the glory of the Lord. 
to turn conversations to giving thanks to the Lord. This is, this is what we do. This is how we are to be instead of the, we take off the old and put on the new. We are imitating God by having a thankful walk. Last thing we'll see here in verse 5 is that the imitating walk is a walk of promise. It's a walk of promise. The promise that you'll see is twofold here in verse 5. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or, or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And so the one promise is that there is no inheritance in the kingdom of God. There is no salvation. There is no eternal life for the one who is immoral or impure or covetous or who is an idolater. Does this mean, let's make sure we understand this, does this mean if you've ever been immoral or you've ever been an idolater or if you've ever been covetous that you can't be in heaven, that you can't have eternal life? No, absolutely, that's not what this means. What this means is for the unrepentant, for the unrepentant immoral person, for the unrepentant idolater, for the unrepentant covetous man, the one who continues to walk in that life, who refuses to repent and turn and surrender to Jesus, there is no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Understand me clearly that this, is, this does not mean that, you know, if a person sins, they're done. No, 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 no. There would be no hope for any of us. This is for the unrepentant, the cold, hard, unrepentant heart. But on the flip side, there is the promise that's kind of implied here for the children of God that there is inheritance. There is inheritance for those who are imitating God, for those who are walking like God and referred to here as the inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And who gets an inheritance? Generally speaking, when we think about who gets the inheritance, we think of the children. And generally speaking, as we've talked about, when we're talking about who imitates their father, we've been talking about children. And so the children of God here are the ones who, who, we're, who we, we see have the promise of the inheritance of God. The children of God who have been imitating God, who have been walking like him, who have willingly surrendered their lives to follow him, to not walk in the immoral way, to not talk in the filthy way but to walk in the new way of life. They have the promise. They are walking and, and, and imitating their father not to get an inheritance. Hear me well on that. We're, it, we are not called, and hopefully none of you are thinking, that boy, if I continue walking well, then I will get my inheritance. If I, if I continue walking this way, I will get an inheritance. No, you walk this way because you have an inheritance. We walk this way. We imitate God because we have surrendered and the inheritance is already ours. We don't earn the inheritance. Jesus earned the inheritance for us. And we walk this way and we imitate God this way because of and in the light of the inheritance that he, he has given us, he has promised us. God cannot, will not break his promises. The inheritance is ours. We don't have to earn it. It's done. Jesus has earned it. And we now get to walk in the light of it. That, that, that's, that's the beautiful thing about this imitating walk is that we get to do it. We get to walk this way because of what Jesus has done through the cross and the resurrection. He's done it for us and now we get to imitate him and walk in the light of the inheritance. And so the question, friends, today is who are you imitating? Who are you imitating? What does your life who does your life indicate that you're imitating? I, I would imagine that, that, that during our response time today, this would be a good time for us to really be thinking about who does my life indicate that I'm imitating? 
Does my life indicate that I'm imitating God and that I'm imitating Him well? Does my life indicate that I'm imitating something, someone far short of God? Or maybe, maybe I should be asking the question in this way. Maybe, maybe we should be asking ourselves the question in this way. If someone started imitating my life, how close would they be to imitating God? If my children and my grandchildren, my nieces, my nephews, my co-worker, whoever it is, if they were imitating my, my life with hopes of being close to God, How close would they be? If they were imitating my life with hopes of walking in the blessing of the inheritance like I'm walking, where would they be walking? And so friends, just as back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Boy, it, it it, it takes some, some confidence in the Lord to be able to tell people, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But guess what? Paul was a fleshly, sinful human just like you and I. Just like you and I. We could be in that same place where we have the confidence in our walk with the Lord to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Are you there today? Are you there, Christian? Are you walking in a way that you're comfortable and confident that if anyone imitated you, they'd be close to Christ? Non-Christian. Non-Christian. The, the door is open. The door is open for you to choose today to start imitating God. See, the invitation that we've read, that we've studied about today, it, it, it clearly opens the door to, to be able to turn away from the immoral, to turn away from the impurity, to turn away from the greed, to turn away from the idolatry, to turn away from the covetousness. And turn to Jesus. Turn to the one who has dealt with that for you. Who will you imitate today? Right.